Okay, I think we're live. Hello everyone and welcome to the final event of our finale festival week on Make For Tomorrow. We are so happy to have you here. Welcome, welcome. If you've been here before, welcome back. If you're new here, thank you so much for coming this afternoon. We are so chuffed that you've um, taken the, uh, this hour in the afternoon to join us. Um, so in case you don't know much about Make For Tomorrow, it's an amazing online participatory arts programme that's been running for like the last two months. And this has been our finale week, so our festival week. It's been an extraordinary extraordinary two months of incredible visual artists delivering workshops and projects and creating beautiful new works with people across Sussex Partnership Trust, either inpatient or out in the community, and then a series of in incredible in conversations with some wonderful actors and writers from the world of film and television um, and literature. And it's been incredible. It's a, this wonderful partnership project. So my name's Lucy. I work for the Trust. I'm the Arts and Health Lead, um, and our service is called Make Your Mark. And we've been working in partnership with the fantastic hospital rooms, who you will find out a little bit more about in a minute, but they're amazing. Amazing. they get visual artists into mental health settings to transform those spaces to make um, them more positive and engaging and just yeah. places to be. And then the other strand with all the artists and performers and actors and writers has been curated by the wonderful Arts Over Borders. They're an amazing organisation also, so do check them out online if you've not come across them before. They are all about creating immersive events in unusual places. So um, really, they do some really exciting work. Um, so they've been bringing in all these incredible actors. Um, and then behind the scenes, we've got COGAP, um, who press all the right buttons and get us all the right links and get us all able to be together here in these virtual spaces, which I know it's not the same as the physical world, um, but nonetheless, it is so important that we can come together, have fellowship, have community, use art to connect us. Um, and if this afternoon is anything like the rest of this programme, it's going to be extraordinary. We've got some amazing people sitting around our virtual kitchen table having a chat. Um, but that's enough from me for now. I'm going to hand over to Tim from Hospital Rooms. He can tell you a little bit more about what they do um, and then he'll introduce the afternoon. But please enjoy. Oh, and before I go, we love to hear from you, okay? This is interactive. So underneath your screen, there is a little button which says, ask a question, and please do. Questions, comments, thoughts, we really wanna hear from you. You click that button, it opens a little Google form, type in whatever you wanna say, click it, and it'll come through to us here in this virtual space. So looking forward to hearing from you and enjoy the afternoon. Tim, over to you. Thanks very much, Lucy. Hi, I'm Tim, and I'm one of the co-founders of Hospital Rooms. I started the charity a few years ago with my partner, Neve, and we bring artists and mental health service users together to rethink how art can transform inpatient mental health units. It's been a really great couple of months collaborating on the Make for Tomorrow program, and we're very happy that the grand finale is this conversation between Rupert Friend and Richard Wentworth. Neve and I met Rupert in my studio a couple of years ago, and since then Rupert's wife Amy Mullins has worked with Hospital Rooms on a project at a psychiatric intensive care unit for women in South London called Eileen Skellen One. Both Amy and Rupert both visited the unit, and now we're really chuffed that Rupert is taking part in this conversation today. Rupert is one of the most respected actors around among his many roles. He's played CIA operative Peter Quinn in Homeland, Vasily Stalin in one of the best films from the last few years, uh, The Death of Stalin, and Theo Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh's brother, and Julian Schnabel's At Eternity's Gate. Richard is an artist interested in how and why things get made, uh, how they fit and how they don't, and he'll shake the hand of the butcher who's added hinges and a lid to the basket of his delivery bike. Richard has worked with hospital rooms on two projects and soon will work with us again at a medium secure unit in Norwich. Last year, after several mornings of conversations with the people at Helling Life Centre, he installed paginations in Ashward, made from pages of the Oxford English Dictionary pasted along the tops of the walls. It acknowledged the air being filled with language, with words, words, words. This week, Richard spoke with a number of people at Helling Life Centre, a place full of brilliant minds, and those conversations and ideas may make some appearances in some way today. There were ideas shared around purpose. There was an idea that so many rules take away a person's rebellious side. And maybe most rules are made by people who just like making up rules. Talked about introspection and indulgence. And maybe touching on an idea that was shared that we've been driving somewhere fast and nature has slammed on the brakes and said, look out the window. And the person who's gonna be chairing this conversation is Julie Allen. Julie's an artist herself, um, and she's also an art therapist who works at Hellingly Centre and also at Lewis Prison. 
And Julie, not unlike the team she works with, uh, that includes Loz, Dylan, Eric, and many more, is a true NHS hero. She's so great at what she does, partly because she's so kind, creative, and patient, and she's going to be guiding us these two other kind, creative and patient people through the next 45 minutes. A big, big thank you to all three of you. Um, Julie, over to you. Oh, thank you, Tim. And welcome, Richard and Rupert. It's great to have you here. Um, really looking forward to the, the discussion this afternoon. I think we're going to have a great discussion. So just to, to actually to start with, I'm um, following on from something Lucy was saying about sitting around the kitchen table. And that was very much, I think, what the service users at Heading Light got out of having you, Richard, with us there. That sense of just getting together with other human beings around the kitchen table, sharing thoughts and ideas, chewing the fat. Um, they absolutely loved the Hospital Rooms project last year, but to have you back digitally felt very, very special really allowing them to connect with the outside world when most of us service users are very disconnected from it. And I've been thinking quite a lot about that afterwards because it was just so lovely. And I've had so much feedback from the patients about how much they enjoyed it. And it seems to me that being human is to be in dialogue with each other. And that's something I think we underestimate sometimes in NHS mental health services, just that the importance of sitting around the kitchen table talking to people and I think we talked about so much didn't we I mean the conversation just flowed and we we talked about history philosophy and closures the environment animals art it's just it was it was amazing so I just kind of want to ask both of you Richard and, and Rupert how obviously we're in very difficult times in the pandemic but how do we keep those connections going? Um, the, the feeling I think from some of our service users was that actually this is a, you know, a lot positive has come out of these difficult times. But just thinking about how going into the future, it may affect art and culture. Rupert. Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to ask you about the butcher's bike. That's that's. You still have a butcher who delivers to you. That's kind of amazing. No, I have very high levels of what my granddaughter calls coincity, which is a word I'm using as often as possible because I want to get it in the OED before I die. So okay. events which are coincidences. So, of course, that's Tim being mischievous. I think we were at some tiny rail halt whose name I forget in the middle of, you know, Rowley Sussex, minding our own business. And we were walking down the street and there was a very eccentric basket on the front of a bike. And we don't actually, I grew up, you know, baskets on front of bikes were sort of like standard. So I'm old enough to think that's how they were. Now they stick out. And this one had some I don't remember the details, but it had some kind of quite elaborate sort of waterproofy, liddy, I could carry something else on the top of this arrangement. And I'm very quick. I mean, I don't I don't look for stuff. I'm I'm a I'm a finder, I'm not a seeker. And, and normally that would be private. And I, I am quite private, even though I'm a bit too garrulous, but I am private. And of course, Tim was a witness to the moment at <laughs> which I became basket, bicycle basket checker of, you know, up, upper Snodgrass. And then, of course, <laughs> the owner came out and said, why are you looking at my bike? And But actually, I'm really interested in that very narrow space in which you can meet other people. I mean, it's quite sophisticated. And I'll, I'll, I'll finish this bit by just saying, there's a man who some, some of you may know, who's a very old friend. In fact, it's, it might even be my fault that he's in London called Hans Ulrich Obrist, who's, who is, if you like, Mr. Serpentine. But he's Swiss and he's quite left field in his way of seeing the world. I don't think he's ever been on the tube, although he's lived in London for 20 years. And we were somewhere and I was saying, well, you know, when you get in a cab, 
if you don't ask a direct question, but you ask a question at the right angle, you may end up with one of the, some of the best conversations you can have and they justify the fare. You know, you may be grumbling that it's going to cost you 20 quid, but actually you're getting this energy and you're of course making it, you're, you're contributing, you're part of it. And so he, he, you know, it was just, it was kitchen table conversation. But he told me afterwards that he got in a cab and said, where are you from? And the cab driver said, I'm from fucking London, mate. <laughs> or maybe he said Essex, I don't know. And, and, and Hans Ulrich couldn't understand why the transaction went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so same, same. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, I mean, the, I love the idea of being open to, I mean, coincid coincity, is that the word you're grand? Terrific word, I'm gonna use it a lot. I'll help you get it in the dictionary and get you and she credited. I think it's great. Because I, I realized if, if you're not careful, then the tools as an artist or an actor or anyone who creates or imagines or envisions, they get a little bit desiccated because we need to stay open to the fact that it might be that cab driver that gives us the gem that leads, that unlocks the next thing. It might be that bike basket. It, but if we go around with the closed sort of blinkers, you know, horses wear blinkers for a reason to stop them from doing that and get them to focus on the task ahead. And I feel like at every stage from, um, from school all the way through, we're told this, you know, focus on the task ahead, stop looking out of the window, you know, stop uh, daydreaming. You know, my wife gave an amazing talk on the power of daydreaming. And com conversation is part of that. I don't know what you're going to say. This isn't a lecture. It's not my thoughts coming out or yours. It's, it's what comes out when we put these elements together of Julian, Richard and Tim and myself. That's the great unknown. And I figure the unknown is where the good stuff is. I think, I mean, what, what's really nice is I was thinking about the uses of fear. So I came to this from a, um, a not very interesting hospital appointment, which of course could, can always contain a bit of fear. And in amongst that, you know, I was that thing where you suddenly go, my God, is there anyone in the NHS who isn't from Scotland? I mean, everybody seemed to be Scottish <laughs> where I was. And, and very once you broach that subject, once you say something where you Obviously you can detect it because they speak very beautifully and you hear it and I'm a stupid southerner and so forth. But the moment you get across that little space, stuff starts to happen. But in fact, that's, that is provoked really by fear. You know, so I was in victim mode, you know, I was told to do something and then do something else and things were being stuck to me and all that. Uh, but it's not very useful to be fearful and then you think, well, how do I break the code? You know, what is the, how, how polite am I meant to be? Or how subservient or how boring is this work for them? Or who have they seen this morning? Or what, are, you know, speculating on somebody else's space, really, um, which is very intense. Um, and if you can, if you, I find the moment of breaking it, I'm quite fearful of that moment. And I think, you know, within my family, I think I'm embarrassing because <laughs> they can feel it coming. But I, I say that because actually I was fearful of meeting you, uh, which I think is a sort of rather, you know, you don't, you don't really, that's not really how you meet people. I mean, uh, this is a meeting, but it's constructed and you know, I know bits and pieces about you and, and Tim speaks very well about you and what have you. So your your repute goes before. And then you're kind of going, oh, my God, I'm not up to speed. And I don't know, how, you know, and I'm sort of. Yeah. And I think we don't have language for talking about that anxiety and the uses of that anxiety. I, I mean. Um, Richard, when you said um, it going back to the moment earlier in the hospital, you talked about the moment that your family are apprehensive of you arriving at. Is that the moment when you decide to kind of 
pop the fear and do something to disperse it? What's the moment that you talked about? I, actually, that might that might be, and I, of course I brought it up because it, I sort of quietly imagine that acting could be a bit which I can't do. I mean, it's not I'm not an actor, but um, I am an actor in the sense that I'm. Every, I think the thing that's so interesting about this period is that you just we have all learned how I don't like the word, but how performative we are. We've all discovered. Oh my God, culture is yama 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 about anything um you know can i have a railway ticket or all the old of course that's part of what's been going on is we're reminded that those transactions were already horribly reduced you know you don't speak to anyone really if you want to get a rail ticket i try i try and remain that i'm just old school but i prefer to go to a window <laughs> and say can i have a one and four pence to so and so but I think we've discovered what's in that fear of the, this interpersonal space. And we've also discovered that that's what culture is. You know, long before we name the theater or painting or, you know, the act of exhibiting, that, that our, how we rub along is, is, our, is the great engine of being alive. And, you know, it's, of course, it's very charming that, that you get jumped by Tim and he says, you know, world expert on butcher's baskets or something. But that, of course, only arose out of another of those incidents. And that's how we remember each other. That's what, that's what, that's what our association and free association is made of. And I don't think that's really, I think, what you brought put into the discussion i don't think that's really discussed in education at all mostly because of what you also said which is that education although it's different from how i was invited to do it or made which is face the front put your hand up don't speak out of turn you know actually con form ist and you, you didn't say that, but you meant it. And, and I think that's, for most children, that's, it's not entirely healthy. No, and I, in fact, I'm really very interested by the words we use and the power that they have, which may be uh, sort of implied rather than overt. And I spoke with somebody who's a kind of progressive educational reformist and his whole Thing was predicated on the difference between when you educate someone you do something to them when somebody learns they do something for themselves and we all know that the best way to gain mastery of something is to do it for yourself not to be told it so even the word you know get get that boy educated or that boy says i'm learning that girl says i'm i'm enjoying learning and um so i find that very interesting distinction and the other thing about fear that i think is an incredibly important thing that we don't talk about you know stage fright for example in my uh, world fear of public speaking if we were doing this you know on a sort of stage or forum or something it i would have to really double down on how to get around the fear which i which i would have and one of the things i have relied on over the years is that fear has often been a very good indicator of what I should be doing. If it feels in my pit of my stomach terrifying, it's often been a great reason to say, well, then you should do it. Otherwise, what's the alternative? You stay in your comfort zone, you don't grow, you atrophy, you crystallize or whatever. And so fear for me has always been like a kind of fairy on my shoulder saying, yeah, I know you feel that way, but that is actually a good feeling, or can be. Obviously, if you're walking and you touch a hot thing, you should be scared, take your hand off. But I think the body is, and the mind is capable of discerning between. In fact, Richard, I read something that you'd said um, about the correlation between a small child knows it doesn't need to step in front of a truck to know that that's dangerous. There is an innate animal pre-programming there. 
yeah, we have to teach them not to step into the road and things, but there are basic things that we know are scary to protect us. And then there are things which are scary perhaps to invite us. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, and I think that uh, the trouble, trouble is because this is a conversation between people who I hope we can say this with a small e, you know, we're very highly educated, we're used, we enjoy talking to other people, we, um, I think on the whole, I try not to spend too much time with people like me, but nonetheless, I, I you know, humans have worlds and, and they inhabit those worlds, it's not a, a total accident that we're invited to speak to each other, but there is something about um, and I know why I said that because I was just about to use the word self-knowledge and I was thinking <laughs> because it, it sounds grand or or it sounds even suggests I know something about myself but actually the strangeness of self-knowledge so what you were just describing I think really well is is knowing which kinds of fear are useful to yourself you know, so when you're, you've got a part and you've, you know a lot about the context and you know who you're going to work with and you, then perhaps terror is too much, but serious anxiety is probably, <laughs> and, you know, then that, but, you know, and, and because I've something to do with what, what you do uh, for work. I'm I'm sort of hyper conscious of language today, so I'm overhearing words. So I was thinking about, you know, when one is trying, but also that you there's an old fashioned term which you don't hear so much anymore, which is a situation can be very trying. Yeah. And uh, probably we're all very fearful that this could be a trying situation. And I'm already completely relieved and think oh, we can just talk for 24 hours. Don't worry. Likewise. <laughs> But how funny that is that, that when you're exercising, you're trying, um, tr whatever it is, the, the trying nerve, you know, the, the one that's useful. And you said something absolutely beautiful, which is a, a, a half malapropolis, proper liberalism. <laughs> it's just, you said, uh, chrysal chrysal crystallize. And you crystallize. Were saying, <laughs> crystallize. And then you kind of go, yes. You know, that is the whole point. I mean, I've never heard that before. I've never said that before, but now you say it, it's between chrysalis and crystallize. Mm -hmm. So we've got two words for the dictionary. Yeah, exactly. And that's how language obviously got, got invented. I think, um, who wrote Clockwork Orange? Um, Anthony Burgess. Yes. I had, years ago, I had a book of his and I don't really read books. I just have them and I look in them and I see bits and pieces but he said that that language is secondhand and i think the title of the book might be something like a mouthful of hot air or something yeah um but everything we say is used goods someone said it maybe even the bloody sentence has been spoken before and we magically re-employ it and occasionally, whilst re-employing it, you actually invent something. So, you know, all the all the cliches, I think, you know, when I think of whoever said window of, of opportunity the first time, you know, hurrah, brilliant. Sorry it got repeated. <laughs> yes. A moment like crystallize and crystallize is sexy. It's really lovely and very imagistic. I mean, really powerful, I think. Our chrysalises, are what you know, you find them as a child, and is that is that a life form? You know what? Ooh. Yeah, and, and and if you were to zoom in with a magnet, magnus, magnoscope, I've just done it again. <laughs> if you to zoom in with a magnoscope, <laughs> you might see that the chrysalis's structure was lots of crystals, like snowflakes. I don't know. So yeah, image, Im very, very imagistic. Yeah. We've had um, a couple of questions, sorry to interrupt this amazing discussion, but we've had a couple of questions from Charlotte. How can we channel our collective fear that we are all experiencing at the moment? And then Charlotte says, Richard, you are like a philosopher. What is the use of philosophy when you're living with fear? God. 
I can hear my wife laughing in the background. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Why don't you go first? Um, okay, well, I obviously let Richard speak to his own philosophical thoughts on things. Because um, I'm not a philosopher, but I am someone who's a student of energy. And, you know, whether you're a physicist or a spiritualist, you would agree that the world is made up of energy, of vibration specifically. And I don't have a kind of practical manual on how to um, channel fear generally, especially during this incredibly disconcerting time of people being locked in their homes, sort of metaphorically anyway. Um, but I do think that it is an energy. Fear, if you were to take the parallel of the actor or the public speaker walking out onto stage, is that 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 lady, that man is feeling an incredible amount of energy and it's being told to their nervous system that it is fear. But it is also just energy that if you can learn to redirect it, you can employ it elsewhere. And you basically just got handed a souped up Ferrari engine where before you had a tractor. So to me, it's like, I don't know because I don't know the circumstances of every person in the world, but I know that something that has been helpful for me when I have felt fear, and it could be fear that a loved one is unwell, it could be national, international fear like we're experiencing now, or it could be specific, like I'm going to have to do this performance. If I can recognize that I just got my engine tuned up and then redirect that energy, I, I basically have a superpower. So I would say um, to, to sort of, there might be something else that you love doing that you just got given this gift of extra energy to do and to channel it there is is one way. God, that's lovely. Um, well, you said something, uh, you said, obviously, I'm having a bit of a, of a, a word attack today, but you used the word disconcerting. And I remember, you know, probably quite recently uh, noticing that the middle of that is, is concert, a concert. Mm. And because English is this soup language, you know, it's made of half a dozen languages, if not more, uh, highly corrupted. Um, when I was at school, I mean, one of the very few things I remember from being told at school, and I bet it was told as a jest and possibly even on the last day of term as a kind of let's have fun today. So not in within conventional education, but somebody said, the impenetrability of matter in Anglo-Saxon is the ungo throughsomeness of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one, it's one of my sort of pointless memories, but it's also gorgeous because you don't have to have know about classics. You don't have to know about Latin or Greek to, I mean, you, it would be nice to know, but impenetrability of matter is, to all intents and purposes, Roman, and I'm going through some list of stuff is kind of someone near Hamburg or you know, <laughs> on the Polish border. Um, and I think that this, I mean, I don't think that, that what's happened to us in this period is exceptional. I think we're, I, I would say that we're privileged because we don't have parents. So we, our parents have died. Uh, so there's nobody we know that we care for who is very confronted. There's, there's one person uh, is pretty confronted, but by world standards, we are in a rather voyeuristic position. We're about, my wife and I are about the same age. We've known each other for 50 years. There's, you know, usual histories of, of laughter and, and, and crap, et cetera. And a large part of what we've talked about is uh, what does it mean to be in a condition of collective introspection? So constantly speculating that what we're thinking can't be very different from what somebody else is thinking. And what we're frightened of can't be very different from what somebody else is frightened of. But the way that you used to know that was you might hear it on the bus and you, even I might not interrupt that conversation, but I might hear it or, I, you know, if you like listening to 
the tenor of the world around you, then you you hear it, fear and joy and madness and uh, stupidity and cleverness and and flair. You hear everything, and mostly you don't translate that. You internalize it. You don't. It'd be very boring if you went home and say, "Guess what happened for the last hour on the bus?" So. I think there's been something very odd about the way that we've speculated about quite a lot about ourselves in the sense that we've speculated a great deal about the dead parents and our grandparents who we sort of knew, but they, they died when we were quite young. For no other reason than that's the only theatre we can refer to. It's the only sort of proscenium we've got access to because everything else is speculation everything else is what is somebody else got you know watching the news is a a minor assistance to being alerted to what other people go through but of course we're from the class that's very critical of how the news is constructed so we go oh god you know another mawkish session with you know not because we're mocking what somebody might have genuinely experience and be articulating within their own ability but, but because I think there's a sort of funny there's something quite I, I'm getting a bit tangled here but I'll, I'll finish by saying to I, the, one the most amazing thing for me is that the Warhol and Bruce Nauman show are on simultaneously unseeable sadly but but both on simultaneously at Tate Modern and they somehow frame absolutely what we're talking about so Warhol, who I guess conventionally you would say would be, I don't know, Aspergerish or a bit autistic or whatever, a very exceptional guy, in so many ways has visited so much of what we witness. And I remember once, I mean, years ago, saying something slightly tutty. He made these paintings, the disaster movie, disaster, not movie, uh, that's later. He made these uh, paintings called the Disaster Series, which had, which were reproductions of terrible events. So bad car crashes, bad, um, horrible suicides, stuff. And I remember saying, I would have been maybe less, I was under 30 when I said this. I remember saying something like, he shouldn't do that or something tutty. And another artist, Glenn Baxter said, yes, but you don't live in New York. And that's the front page of The Sun, front page of the New York Post every day. So it's a reproduction of a reproduction. And of course, that's largely what humans are doing is we, half my language is learned from broadcasting or, you know, it's, it's not truly interpersonal. So there's this funny thing where we're all recipients of experience, which is not our experience, which, you know. Well, in fact, um, we're, we're at the moment, we're shooting uh, a kind of a courtroom drama. And so, and I'm not playing a lawyer, but I was having a long conversation with someone who is, who said that the entire way that we perceive a courtroom, unless you're unlucky enough to have been in one, is through the movies and TV, where everyone says, objection, and they stand up and they shout and they, and apparently that is nothing like what it is like. It's incredibly dry, incredibly academic, almost sotto voce in the way that it's delivered these very compelling arguments. It is entirely um, uh, distanced between the, the, the advocates and the defendant or the prosecution and the defendant. Um, but we have come to expect a completely made up version of something we all think we know. Another obvious example would be people dying on screen. Uh, you, none of us have died. So there's no way to know what that's like. <laughs> Actually, I've come up close to myself as well. That's where um, I was. But, <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, none of us have died. So when we say, oh, I know how I would die, or I know how this character would die, it's, it's a reproduction of a reproduction. Yeah, and, and and how are you going? That's so nice to hear that because I I very I very slightly know Patrick Marber and I loved seeing him in, I forget where he played a, a, a barrister, but oh. anyway, I mean, and I even had an uncle who was, and a cousin in, in the business, 
but they weren't close. So I never had this conversation with them, which of course I, is another part of what we're talking about. The huge regret of the people that you could have talked to slash should have talked to, but for reasons of callowness, shyness, fear, you didn't. And then you're left, you know, where you had the keys to some extra piece of information or knowledge or experience or, you know, that, that you can just borrow because hell, they were relations. And then you didn't do it. And I think that that's a very powerful for, for people, you know, let's say over 55, 60, I would say everybody is in a heightened regret space for that that kind of reason. But I'm, what will you do? So what's the decision? Are you going to play it very boringly? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the point of drama is that it's often ordinary life condensed. So, you know, it, it's, it's you're compressing facts, compressing time, trimming shoe leather, as they say, to try and get to the, the, the meat of it. Um, and so if you were to do it, it would feel like, um, they don't have C-SPAN here, but whatever the House of Commons TV is, the sort of, and they do amp that up because they do all their theatrics in there. But, you know, the, the point of drama is to try and find the, the nub, the essence of, of, the, of the problem. And actually that reminds me of a, another made up word, which you might enjoy. Um, I, I never forgot seeing Dennis Potter interviewed by Melvin Bragg on The Late Show or whatever it was. And, Dennis Potter was very near the end of his life and he had champagne in one hand and morphine flask in the other. It was clearly in incredible pain um, and had to stop the interview multiple times. It's the most moving thing to look up on YouTube. If you haven't seen it, I strongly advise you to. Um, and Bragg asks him what has changed in knowing the amount of days you have left on the planet as Potter does at this point. He has been given a very, very a sort of unwavering prognosis. And he talks about looking out of his kitchen window and recognizing and loving and appreciating the blossomness of the blossom, um, the, the quality that made it cherry blossom. And I misremembered this because I saw it, you know, 20 years ago. And in my head, what he said was the nussness of blossom. The essence of the essence of the thing. So the Richard Wentworthness of Richard Wentworth, the Julie Allenness of Julie Allen, and I went round for two decades quoting Dennis Potter wrongly with a made-up word, but I now love that word so much because if you're ever in a quandary, it really helps to sort of think, well, what's the nussness of the thing or of the person? What am I trying to find? Is the essence of the person? Um, and I think, Richard, you know, you used a couple of words describing why people don't reach out to relatives, friends, colleagues, and where that regret comes from. And you said, you know, possibly from shyness and then from fear. So then again, we have this idea that perhaps these are indicators. Shyness is a form of fear, right? So indicators, I'm shy to call my whoever, my uncle, to talk about this thing, or I'm scared of what he might say or do but I'll regret it if I don't. They sort of somehow go hand in hand. Well, I think to, the nusness is, is great. And actually it rhymes with something that, that, that sort of, maybe this is sort of turning into a kind of um, uh, some sort of family talk show. <laughs> but um, uh, my granny was never very well. And, um, I suspect that because this was in the 50s, that things were done to her that we wouldn't countenance now, but that's the history of, of medicine. And I probably as a child understood very, very poorly that the, that, that was a pressure on my mum, uh, her mum. And certainly didn't have you know I was a child I didn't have the equipment to enter into it and I was aware that things would be said that would have other meanings but I didn't know what they are which I think is the condition of being a child but actually that continues into adult life where you realize you're not being invited into something for some reason or or and that classically I would say that's a 
that's what prof what the Victorian professions invented. You know, that's our business. That's what the lawyers are doing when yeah. they say, no, don't say that in court. And you go, yeah, but that's what happened. Yeah. And I remember my mum being asked how how granny was. And my mum saying ishish. Ishish. And, and I didn't know that ishish was sort of a term. Exactly. You did. That's beautiful. And I it sort of it stayed with me as if she'd spoken Serbo Croat, you know, it's or I almost can rem I think I could take you to the space off Haverstock Hill where it was spoken. Wow. Um, so the, this thing where language and subject matter, content, language, space, memory, experience, um, you know, yet I, would I be nine? I don't know, but not a teenager, I don't think. And it's funny that you, you and I think that's why I enjoy, you know, that's what, why I like the word conversation. I like doing this because if the other person is going to throw a few things up, all the things that you've already referred to are set running. And, and you're obviously not only is it your business, but you were obviously always pretty good at it. I slightly mm -hmm. imagine you as a child being asked to leave the table because you were joining in too much or. <laughs> but I mean, it's a very, um, I mean, the, 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 I think it's quite deep in humans that they, they, they would like to be productive, but they don't know what that means. So the, the first part of being productive is, is not to die of hunger. You know, it's the absolute, the baseline, but what is it that you can do beyond beyond that and actually when we talk with each other it's always you use the word you know it's it's energized but what is so strange is when the i mean i'll i'll, I'll do it with it because it's visual i'll tell you this so um how do i tell it simply i was told i should go to the doctor and I said, oh, I really don't think I should. No, you should go. So I, I went to the local hospital and did as I was told. And it involved um, one of those heart, they put the, sticker, the stickers and the cables and what have you. So it was lots of comedy. I mean, I more or less knew it wasn't anything that we needed to worry about, but I, I was being a good boy. And all the cables were all tangled up. And the nurse said, it's funny that they didn't think of this when they made it. And I've got quite a strong, small D design brain. And I was even in the mid sixties, I was a student with James Dyson. So I know the story of how you can modify hairdressing or whatever. Um, and I was thinking, shall I, shall, I, shall I drop the, shall I do a James Dyson moment? No, don't do that. And then she said, who's going to sort this out? And I said, my son, who's an engineer. And then, but she didn't respond to that. And I think she was sort of frustrated with it. So I was in a sort of state of being respectful. She was, inverted commas, working for me, but I was performing for her. I had to be passive for this to work. Don't over talk to the lady because she's had other troubles in the morning. She doesn't need my stupid jests, what have you. But as it sort of went along, I was thinking of all these lost opportunities. There's the fun of talking about whatever electrocardiograms are, you know, not my world. But the punchline was that she set it up and it and it did something wrong and it made this unbelievably brilliant graph that was sort of, you know, really the best printout you could hope for. So I said, very lightly, could I have that? And she went, no. <laughs> and she spoiled my morning. You know, I, I just, you know, it would be, what a great Christmas card. <laughs> <laughs> would be brilliant. I think you have a right to that, surely. It's, it's, it's a nationalised medical service and, you know, you pay your taxes and... You weren't with me. <laughs> you weren't with me to say, look, this is my I'd, friend. Yeah, I would have gone, I would have gone in hard. I'd have been a, like a lawyer on TV. <laughs> 
what is the court case that you're acting? Or can you um, say? Can you? Uh, well, well, can I say? I don't know. I mean, it's the adaptation of a book called The Anatomy of a Scandal. Oh my God. Um, and it centers around a political scandal, but it's really about the scandal of privilege and how privilege isn't even acknowledged by the people who benefit from it for most of their lives and that they trip upwards and get away with things and have friends in high places who pull strings. So it's kind of, it kind of works, we hope anyway, on more levels than just the sort of actual scandal that's being prosecuted and more about looking at a societal scandal, a hierarchy. In real, in real time, we're in the 60s or? No, no, we're, we're probably just before Me Too. So about 2018 to 2019. So it's specifically pre-COVID, because otherwise it's really boring because it's this the whole time. Um, but, and it's, it's not uh, the 60s or even the 80s or 90s where we hadn't had the reckoning that we've had now. Um, it's trying to look at that cusping moment where people are still going, but I, I didn't do anything, but I'm all right. And it's like, well, are you sure? Should we really look at ourselves and are we still able to say that there's no part of society that's benefited us. Um, I, Richard, I wanted to pick up on something you said that I find really interesting about, um, you know, the first productive task or creative task being to feed ourselves. And then once we've done that, can we then look at how do we express ourselves outside of the basic sort of primal needs? And there's kind of two schools of thought, extreme ends of this that I'd love to talk to you about. One being, um, people who'd say, oh, it's all right for you, you make art or you act or whatever, you haven't got to put food on the table or you have already put food on the table and therefore you've got free time and good for you. Um, and therefore I could never make anything because I'm so busy trying to keep food on the table. Um, versus folks who are like, I'm keeping myself in deliberate um, kind of paucity because I think luxury and all of that is stifles the creative. So to try and simplify the question, um, and this is very broad strokes, but some people think, look, I've got to get the primal out of the way to be able to focus on art. And other people would say, I, I need to stay um, uncomfortable in order to be able to make art. And I don't know if you have experience or thoughts on either of those extremes. <laughs> well, I mean, it's such a tender question. Yeah. And I think anybody that you would ask that to would immediately be rehearsing. I mean, it joins up for a very interestingly to, to your court case. Um, how did one find oneself in the position that one is in? What, I mean, I, th I think we don't talk about demography enough. We've got lots of quick, words that we use that we label the world with um class race accent you know ev evident wealth evident lack of wealth or or whatever but they m most of those things collapse pretty quickly in a conversation with somebody and i, I and i think actually quite uh, often rather worryingly you know you realize because we're, we don't really have language for talking about intelligence and stupidity. We have language for talking about A-levels and mm. you know, Oxford and Cambridge or, or double firsts or, you know, we have this reams of stuff about that. And the, the scandal of the summer where the teacher's, the teacher's opinion, even the teacher's opinion is kind of like, well, no, that wouldn't do, you know. So, I mean, it's quite a tender thing, I think, to notice in a young person their their um, their get up and go in all its senses. So, of course, we know that we invented subjects, and we invented marks, and we invented levels, and and what have you. Um, there's something quite strange about inhabiting one's own vessel. I, I feel I'm going very far off the question you asked me, but I'm going to say another, another, I think, because I always talk in spirals, I forget 
where we let where we started <laughs> and i'm going round and i'm looking for that that moment in the maze which i will remember but the, i think the point i'm trying to make is that and then it's a personal reply i found a 19 um i'm going to guess 59 school notebook of mine and since this seems to be a moderately confessional exchange i mean you're not melvin bragg and i'm not dennis potter but um so i was at a sort of sensible little school sent away 50s school you know and of course people can immediately listening to this be judgmental say whatever they like but the fact is that stuff is done to children children are sent away they 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 are put in A, B, and C uh, by a, a strange mixture of allegedly de decisive parents or the, the mad happenstance of demography. You know, we happen to be living there. My dad was a minor. We couldn't move. Did -de 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 -de. so. Everyone's got their story, and that story is always moving. So, in both senses of moving. Uh, but it's quite rare, I think, to suddenly find, I'm, uh, we'll be 73 in a couple of days, to find something from when you were 11 or 12. And it's this notebook where you can see I was an extremely <laughs> obedient child. Mm. And it didn't involve proper crying, but I would say that when my wife and I found it and we were looking at it, we were quite close to weeping. Wow. Because we were so critical of the space in which I had conformed. So, you know, there'd be a dozen ways of looking at this. You could say, oh, he had quite nice handwriting or he was careful with this or he knew how to rub something out and make it look tidy or whatever. And he liked drawing maps and he liked coloring in and what have you. And for the for the purpose, I think it's worth since this is sort of strangely private and public, and and maybe it's much easier talking to somebody who I feel very easy with, but I've never met before. This is the same school that Jane Birkin's brother was at, Andrew Birkin, and also Sebastian Falks, but not a creative school. I mean, not a school that would be remembered for its creativity. And I'm I'm not having a go at anything, but but I think when you when particularly when you get the old men with their pipes going the, the strangeness is that 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 should be done for that's why who do you think you are is a very clever conceit where you somebody goes rumbling off and finds that you know their great great grandfather was the prime minister of swaziland or the madness of it and obviously highly calculated piece of production but this is all happening in historical space and time. And I think the thing that you're talking about, what, what really interests me at the moment is where what used to be called sexism or racism or um, uh, classism, that we're in this amazing foaming vat where it's all in there <laughs> and you know, I remember reading, I'm going to finish, but I remember reading once that the reason that people explore is because, because the history of exploration obviously involves sailing. The reason they explore is because they have a hunch that they might get home. So you need an onshore wind. So the whole of Western Europe has an onshore wind. There'll be other places, for sure, but whole of Western Europe has an onshore wind. So people set off from Western Europe, scoundrels, brigands, crazies, imaginative people, map makers, mostly men. Uh, and the fishermen of Biscay were the people who went with Columbus because they were known to be crazy. They were not because Biscay is just so nuts. They were the best sailors. So, you, you know, we weren't there. We are white. Uh, we're Europeans. 
and they set off and the rest and you know we can draw maps and talk about who went where when and what they did and how this happened and how power accrued and etc but i think what what is extraordinary is to be living at a moment where all of that is in this sort of vat of and in a way it's a sort of moment of mass education which is why i mentioned this funny little school book which, which sort of denies what i've just said really Richard, sorry. I'm so sorry to have to interrupt i mean it just it just feels really really bad to tell you that we're coming towards the end that i can't believe that, wow. that so quickly what an incredible discussion and um yeah, it would be great to continue. We, we haven't had a chance for questions, but the quite a few people have said how much they really enjoyed it and found it incredibly stimulating. So thank you. Thank you both so much. Well, can we thank you and Tim and Eve and, and all the magicians? And it I it's like um um I've I've never um, dialed a sex line or anything, but it's very nice meeting Rupert and feeling, I mean, disarmingly at ease with somebody. So I thank Rupert. Thank you. Thank you. I feel exactly the same. It's, I feel like we may have known each other in another life or something like that, but I feel like I could sit and listen to stories and bat the ball around for hours uh, were we allowed. And I, I'll, um, if I may, uh, reach out to, to Tim and, and get your information so we can talk yeah. another time. Yeah. And, and um, it seems inappropriate to send one's love to an institution because it's clearly that's what more COVID nonsense, but my love to Hellingly. Oh, and I'm sure they would send their love right back to you, Richard. And I, I mean the people, you know, it's made of people. It's not, a, not, not just fabric. I will pass that on to them. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.